did so well. I'm so impressed. He got us back to the car. He had his poop. I picked up his first poop. Big moment for us as a new team. Good morning. It is Saturday. I literally just called him Gallop and he still came running over. Didn't you, Mr. Banks? Yes. Yes. Oui. Bon. Such a good dude. I just love him so much. So it is Saturday morning. We have half day training on Saturday. Thank you, God. I am tired. Paparino is tired. We're all tired. So we have half day of training. It is still Saturday morning, but I changed a little bit because we're doing outdoor work and it's a bit gray today and rainy. We are practicing walking in streets that don't have sidewalks and that aren't car lined. So we're working on following the border um, with the dog and kind of weaving through um, obstacles that would be there. So for a lot of people who live in, you know, residential neighborhoods, they might not have sidewalks and people might be parking their cars. So it's just reenacting that kind of situation. You know that behind you is a, do you call it a cement border or pavement? I don't know, the, the, this here I'm talking about? Oh, the, um, what would that be called? Curb. 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 Yeah. But it's, yeah, okay, a curb. <laughs> so. We're gonna be following the, the curb, okay. right? We're gonna start with the border on the left of the dog. So, how you you are gonna uh, check yep. that you're still close to, to the border is that you're gonna walk starting with the curb on your left. Mm -hmm. And after, I don't know, 15, 20 steps at first, you're gonna ask your dog to stop and as he stays next to you, you're gonna check with, with your foot where the, the border is, okay. the, the curb is, I'm sorry. Okay. Here, while this music is playing, we are seeing Benix guide Molly alongside the curb in hyperspeed, performing tasks that the instructor just gave. did so well. I'm so impressed. He got us back to the car. He had his poop. I picked up his first poop. Big moment for us as a new team. And um, he just did so well. And then when he turned the corner and realized he saw the cars and that we were coming back, all of a sudden he slowed down. And he was walking like a little sad turtle. Like, I don't want to go home. I've had so much fun today. <laughs> all right, so we are back to campus for lunch. I am so hungry. Um, everybody's heading in, but I thought I'd show you how we've been trained to get the new guide in and out of the car. So take the harness off. He does not wear the harness in the car, just for his own comfort. I have him assi. As you see, he is assi, <laughs> AKA sitting and I tell him rest, rest, I get out and then op. Bon chien. Mr. Benix here and I were running on harness <laughs> down the path. It was so fun. I never get to run. Good job, buddy. So right now we're going into the park. Um, there's three of us with our guides. Actually, one of them is Benelux's brother, uh, Molson, like Molson Canadian beer. Um, and we're going into the park to work on recall, which means we're letting them just run free and have fun and then calling them back to see how quickly they respond to come back to us. And then those who aren't letting the dog run free have their dog on harness and control them with a the dog distraction. One of the dogs is having lots of fun. They have to sit still and be behaved on harness. Okay, rock, paper, scissors. Rock? Okay, you smash uh, the, 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 the size, the scissor of... Gold. So I'm first? Yeah. <laughs> 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 so I rush, I this. All right, Mr. Benedict, <laughs> it's your turn to have the fun. We just played rock, paper, scissors to see which pupperino gets to just play first. So he's gonna do his off leash running around this place. They'll be controlling their dogs and um, I'll have to do recall to see if he comes when I call him. Now Gallup was never good at that because when his nose worked, his ears stopped. So hopefully this guy's a bit better at it than Gallup. No. <laughs> Very Here we're seeing a happy, wild, and free Benelux run around without his harness in the lovely Mira Park.
So they were just explaining that really they know it's too early in our relationship to, to do this well, but that's why it's a fun test. I can hear him yeah. sprinting. He needs it. He needs yeah, it. has been a stressful first week of work. By the way, this is Ian. Hi, nice to meet you. <laughs> this is Ian. He's the head trainer and he's actually um, Eric St. Pierre, the founder. This is his uh, nephew. So what we're going to work on now is, uh, like I said, recall, but they said it's really too early in our relationship and they know that, but this is just a start. And so what we're going to do is shake the harness, say Vien, while shaking the harness, um, as well as his name, of course. And then once he comes, I have him au pied. Uh, don't worry, I'm gonna go through all the hand gestures with you guys at some point. Um, and then once he's opiate, which is heel, and is standing on my left side, good, then he gets a treat. So that's how we do the recall here. Opiate, opiate, wow, you were so good. He came right away. Okay. He so doesn't have to go until you give the, the order. And it looks that way. Wow, that works. <laughs> He's so good. Relax, bien. Very relax, bien. Au pied, au pied. Oui, assis. Bon, chien. Oui. Look at you see how good that is. He's so good. He's so good. Bien, very relax. He's sniffing. Very relax, bien. He wants to do a little tea before coming. Oh, so here he goes. <laughs> Here, first we're seeing some lovely B-roll footage of the drive from the Mira campus into the town. Then we're seeing Molly and Benix do some work at crosswalks and busy streets. Okay. Okay. You ready? You go. I'm ready. You ready for your uh, yeah. YouTube debut? Yeah. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm excited to have you back for another video. And I think this one's going to be a really good one for anybody who has an interest in guide dogs, service dogs, because this man's life has revolved around said dogs. Mm. Yeah. I'm Nicolas St. Pierre. I'm a general manager from uh, Mira a Foundation based in Quebec. And uh, I grew up in. Uh, and that's cool, which means uh, that's my dad and mom that built it from scratch. A true family business. Yeah, yeah, true family business. So I grew up in the kennel. So, uh, you know, I trained dogs since I'm 17, 17 years old. And uh, I, did, um, I did guide dog program all my life. Uh, I met you when you were 13 yep. and I was uh, not that old at, as well. So I took over to my dad for managing the, the foundation uh, six years ago. So uh, the business go well. Of course, uh, we all face the COVID uh, pandemic, but uh, you know we're going well, and uh, we start over giving guide dogs uh, now with you and some other uh, people that came uh, take their dogs, and we're so excited to uh, to finally restart to give guide dogs to uh, to people. Pre COVID, how many dogs between service and guide did you give out a year? Uh, I, I would say that we're around 400 person asking for having dogs wow. so it's it's we have a, a lot of pressure on this and I would say the service dog with people on the wheelchair uh, we're, we're we're having like we're giving like around 45 50 dogs per year so I'm happy with those numbers but uh, I think that um, I'm gonna go back around those numbers I would say in two or three years I want to you know I want to take more I want to give more guide dogs um, around around Canada because uh, I think people in the beginning they were like it's shy to come in Mira because of the language barrier and, uh, and it's, it, it never be an issue for us but I think it's normal it's far away from from some people in Canada but uh, um, the other school are doing a great job there's no problem but if you want to come to seek, seek a Mira dog for a different reason I think we always always have door opens and uh, we're really looking forward to meet all the guys from around Canada for sure. Okay, hello, Molly from the future. Just want to pop in and just explain some of kind of Mira's rules around who they accept. Unfortunately, at this time, they are only accepting Canadians and youth through Mira USA. 
because unfortunately most Canadians actually have to go to America to receive guide dogs because the supply and demand in Canada isn't there. There isn't enough guide dog schools. We don't have nearly as many guide dog schools um, as there is in America. Funding is much lower here than it is in America. Um, so for a number of reasons, Mira is currently only focusing on supplying dogs for people in Canada um, and returning clients. So somebody like me could get a dog again, um, like even living in Los Angeles because I'm a returning client. Um, so right now they're focusing on returning clients, Canadians and youth. Um, you can be 11 and up to receive a Mira guide dog. Um, and through Mira USA, I believe it's 11 to 16, um, but you would apply directly through Mira USA, not through Mira if you are a youth in America looking to get a Mira dog. Um, so currently that's the rules. They would love to one day be able to expand and accept American clients and clients from other parts of the world. But due to the fact that Canada is a much smaller country with less resources in terms of guide dog schools available, and most Canadians do end up needing to leave the country to get dogs, they want to be able to give as many Canadians dogs as possible. So I just want to mention that because I know a lot of you from around the world watch my videos, learn about Mira, are really intrigued by their training style um, and some of the unique things that they offer. Um, and so before you go out of your way to go through you know, the application process and everything, I just want to be upfront and let you guys know that that is currently how it works. Um, but you can stay tuned and I will, I will update you guys in the future if anything changes. I do also want to mention, um, just to be fully transparent, their expectations for people's orientation and mobility is very high. To be accepted for a Mira dog, you have to have very, very strong orientation and mobility skills and be a very strong independent traveler with your cane. Um, that's really important. Every school has different expectations of orientation and mobility. Some schools give dogs to people who are not cane users. Some exclusively give to people who are cane users. Some have different vision requirements. Some require you to have less vision. Some are more open to having more remaining vision. So every school is different and you really have to look for the right fit for you. Every school has different training styles, different harness styles. Um, different skills they teach their dogs, different lengths of time they teach their dogs, they have different breeds. So you really have to look for the right fit for you. Some schools custom train, some schools do hybrid training like Mira where they'll do part mobility, part guiding and one dog for somebody. Um, some schools don't do any custom training. So it's all about finding the right fit for you. Um, and just like these schools are interviewing you, really you should also be interviewing them to find the right match. Um, and do your own research. There's different training techniques like a balanced training approach, a pure positive reward based training approach. So it's really about finding the right fit for you. Um, but Mira does have quite high expectations um, for orientation mobility skills, specifically going into receiving a guide from there. And yeah, I just wanted to be transparent and let you guys know what you could expect if you were interested in applying for Mira. You know, I, as somebody who speaks nothing but dog French, which when I came, yeah. I knew no French at all. Yeah. I am here for my third time, still don't speak French. You'd think I would have picked something up by now, but again, just dog commands. Mm. And I haven't, ha I've never had a problem, mm. you know? Um, I can't necessarily speak to the other students in my class, but it just means on my downtime, instead of hanging out with everyone else, I'm bonding with my dog. Yeah. So it really is not a, it's a win-win. Yeah. Like I, I'm still able to have the full experience and I think that one of the most special parts about Mira is the fact that you guys train guide dogs for children hmm. because when I had to start using a cane full time at eight years old, I think like a lot of people, it was a hard sell. I did not want to use the cane, hmm. but I had a very bad accident and it was determined that I could not see enough to not use a cane. Hmm. And so the only way they sold it to me was if you get really good at your O&M, you can get a guide dog from Mira when you're 13. Mm. And so I dedicated myself to learning my O&M, both spatial awareness, how to use a cane, how to use my ears, all of these things, so much more than just learning to cross a street. I dedicated myself so I could come and I could get that dog at 13 and getting that dog at 13 completely changed so much of my life. 
my confidence, my independence, the speed at which I could move. Mm. When I was being terribly bullied in school and would sit alone at lunch, I never felt alone because I had Gypsy with mm. me. I had a friend. Yeah. And those things mean so much. And it made me go from feeling embarrassed that I was blind because I had to have this cane to proud that I was blind because I got to have this dog. Yeah. And that's a huge shift in the way you view yourself. And that shift in how you view yourself changes how you portray yourself to others and how they treat you. Yeah. And I, I wish more schools would be able to be more open yeah. to training for children because yeah. if anything, it really changes their life even more than the lives of adults. Can you talk a bit about how you guys chose to train for children and, and what you think yeah, you man, just need to know? Yeah, I can, I can share just a bit of history. Uh, in the beginning, my dad saw me with my dogs when I was like a kid, like seven or six, seven or eight years old. And I was, you know, I'm, uh, I'm the only child in my family. So I was kind of a lonely kid and living in the country. And, uh, you know, my friends were far away in school. So when I was coming back from school uh, at the end of the afternoon, I was alone. So uh, my best friend was, was my dog. And my dad saw me, the bound that I create with my dogs at the time, it was a golden retriever that called Kelker. It, it means in, in English, uh, somebody his name it was somebody so <laughs> quelqu'un en français and um, and uh, that guy you know play with me like crazy i was hiding in the, in the woods uh, playing hide the game i was playing a lot of stuff and my dad saw me i was really creating a real bound and he said why why you know blind kids could not do the same bound with with the dog so he started to work with uh, noel champagne at the, at the time and try to compare you know the bounding that uh, uh, children with with vision that create with dogs and children with no vision create the bound with the dog and they observed that the kids uh, the low vision kids they were like uh, bounding with their dogs like 10 times more because they were focused on it yeah. so because the other one was playing Nintendo and Mario Bros and stuff like this and the other one no so at the time, uh, start to you know think about how to teach O and M skills to the kid and and put the parents really involved in the project and create people like you, Molly. And I was saying, you know, just one half, uh, half an hour ago, I was saying to the guy that walking next to me when I saw you working, I said, do you realize how the kids grow up? When they, they grow up with the guide dogs, became so good with their dogs. Even it's the third one, five, fifth one, or whatever one. Because all the skills that you build when you're a kid, it's like concrete. You don't change. You know how to do it. Yeah. And uh, even how to create bounding with the dogs, you're less shy. Because sometimes some adults that never had dogs, and they come, let's say, at 40 years old, and come in the school, and it's in the first time that they have to pet the dog and everything they're shy they're shy to look, look like a fool in the living room because some of the kids you know like you guys are laying down on the floor doing stuff don't worry play with them and they don't know how to do it when yeah. you're kids you don't think about it you just go in the relationship and you go for all for all of it yeah so i think that's the big big difference between the guys that come for the first dog at 13 15 years old in the difference between an, an adult come for the first dog i think yeah. the relationship is it's really crazy so so yeah it's it's uh it's uh it's it's a program that we're so proud of and i don't want to stop to give dogs to kids and i really push and um, you know encourage other schools to doing it but, but some of the school are all they have policy they don't want you know go out of their policy don't i don't judge that i think i just think mm -hmm. that you know for us it's it's a big success story yeah, really and works. i don't want to change that and i i think it makes a real real difference and i can tell you all the trainers all the people that work in the guide dog industry i can tell you that the real fuel that we have when we work it's when we realize that the dog and the person bound the dog that we train after six months, seven months with them, they don't even look at us and they know their job and they bond with the person that we give. That's the thing that we seek for. Like, what do you think are things that somebody should consider when they're thinking about getting a guide dog? 
like if they're if they're trying to figure out if a guide dog is right for them in their life what are things you think they should consider the first thing is are you ready to push your boundaries I think it's it's the real thing push you out of your comfort zone because the dogs what what brings you it brings you open the world so if you work your with your 1m skills really working and then you know doing giving skills that you know that you can be safe and travel most of the around all type of cities and stuff like this for sure you're going you know a little bit out of your comfort zone i think guide dogs it's it's a big it's a big gift that you guys you can give to yourself to push the boundaries and give you uh, open stuff that you never thought about it before i think i think after the other thing i would say it's I will never say something negative about the cane, but when you travel with a cane, for sure, man, even if you're the a Jedi master with your ears and you can go and you are just most not touch stuff, it's still that you have tactile, yeah, you know, traveling. With a dog, you're like flying. Yeah, so it no gives tactile. a fluidity, yeah. crazy fluidity that it, it gives you like sky high feelings and you know you can you know like you guys when you walk and you I see the flow and it's very easy Smooth. it's super fluid I think it's I think it's the most thing I would I would say that's if you're ready to do that after all the all the stuff that you have to work for to having a dog it's it's worth it when I train a dog and he knows stuff he's gonna know for the rest of his life and it stay like a concrete it it's not like this. No, it's you guys, consistent. Yeah, work. we yeah. become trainers exactly. to our own dogs. Exactly. You, yeah. you, in the conditioning, you're doing the stuff that the trainers give the codes to the dog to work, and after you have to continue in the same language. Yeah. The thing is with people that they have low vision and let's say higher low vision. The thing is, I think it's super normal to, uh, you know, work with your low vision mm -hmm. and some to try to see for sure. Yeah. And I, I would say that sometimes you have reflexes that it's normal to put your shoulder back to not, you know, uh, hit, hit someone or a post on the, on the, on the, the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. So what, what brings that if the dogs realize that they have to be less concentrate, less cons consistent on their work. So the training precision go down and sometimes some levels that they don't even work and they yeah. don't understand the difference between when the time the, the, per, the person see or does not see. That's not the best. But I would say I saw some exception. People are doing the crazy work of constancy and say when it's getting dark and I don't see nothing, it worth it to play when I see like I didn't see. Mm. But it's kind of commitment that I that I didn't see a lot. It basically, you know, for for people who can see a bit more, if they can see an obstacle, they might try to avoid it themselves instead of letting their dog avoid it for them. Mm. And then if, like you said, like you have RP like me and you lose your vision totally at night, you can't see that obstacle now. But your dog has now decided that you can mm. because you helped him move out of the way. And so now he's going to be walking you into things. And so I, I do feel you need to rely on your dog fully for your dog to continue to know what to do. Exactly. And the less you actually rely on your dog and the more you rely on your vision, your dog is going to lose its skill. And for some people who have a lot of sight remaining, the time that the dog actually takes away from their life is not worth it. And so I really do think it's important for people to understand when the dog is right for them and to really take a look. This isn't just a pet. This is a $40,000 dog that has taken a lot of funding and a lot of people's time and care and effort. Yeah, yeah exactly. And if, if you really need to look at your lifestyle, your vision, and what you would really be using it for, because if, if you're relying too much on your own sight, you have to remember that for somebody like me who really can't see, this dog gives me my life back. But if I could still see enough, then he would actually be taking time away. Exactly. Because I'd be reworking him and training yeah. him and doing a lot of these things. And that's actually what my boyfriend realized in dating me was previous to dating me, he was considering getting a guide dog. 
but he has a lot of remaining vision left. And so even though he's fully blind in one eye and 20 over 400 in the other, he's realized now that when he sees me work my dog, it gives me life, it gives me freedom. But he knows now that he has too much sight, that the time and commitment of a dog would actually take time away from his life. Absolutely. So, and it wouldn't have the same reward. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't have the same balance. For me, the time my dog takes that I have to dedicate to him is so worth it because there's balance in what he gives me back. But if somebody who still has a decent amount of remaining sight, but you think still could benefit from a guide dog, do you train them differently than the way you would train somebody who's closer to fully blind? Yeah, we're, we're having those classes in the fall when game the, 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 the dark come uh, at uh, four o'clock. So we're working a lot, uh, with the, we're playing with the lights, we're playing in the lights of the kennel when the, with, in the beginning of the class and after we're doing a lot of stuff at the end of the afternoon just, just to getting darker and people realize that oh my god I don't see and I really have to re rely on my dog so most of them I saw different people different reaction I saw people that they were experienced that and say oh my god it's too much complicated with a dog I want to go back and others that with the same level of vision the same condition they say oh it worked it for me so it depends really it's a really a personal choice mm -hmm. I would say and for for different people i think i saw some people that say i want to be ready when my vision is going to decrease and i'm going to be able to work with my dog the proper way if yeah. my vision decreases during that i'm having my dog i'm going to already have my dog so i'm open with that but there's some compromise that we those guys have to do that getting heavier they're traveling because they're less efficient that if they go with their vision and like just go right away on the spot that they they see they cannot do that with a dog because they have to do the commands and stay and rest and do the commands and left and they change direction and all the stuff that slow down them yes you can't so, go as fast exactly as you want. so it's yeah. it's really really a personal choice yeah yeah and I think another thing that makes Mira so special um, is that you don't pre-match and that's no. extremely unique. I've never heard of another school that does that yeah. and I know a lot of my blind followers who have guide dogs from other schools yeah. find this very interesting because yeah. I've got when I got Gypsy I worked three dogs, Gallop I worked five and with Benny Lux I worked five. That's that's a lot of opportunity to to experience the feel in a handle, yeah. the speed, the pull, the personality, the connection. I yeah. remember Benny Lux was the third dog I worked day one and I felt at peace. Like I just felt this sense of peace yeah. and I felt like I knew him. This is such a special experience. Yeah. And you know, with Gallup on, on the Wednesday I got Mistral and by Friday we collectively decided Mistral isn't right. Let's go back. Let's get Gallup. Yeah. And to be able to have that fluidity yeah and have a say in it this is my dog that, yeah, that's yeah. going to be my eyes for the next six to eight years yeah and to be able to contribute to making that decision and having open conversation with the trainers i couldn't value that enough and it's one of the biggest reasons i think i would struggle to switch schools yeah is to not get any say and to just kind of show up, be given my dog, and if that doesn't work, there's no other, one. There's no other option, yeah, you yeah. know? And, and so why is that the approach that you guys have chosen to take? Uh, a lot of reasons. I would say that the first reason that when we... The first, first mantra, I would say, uh, it's um, we train with some living stuff, which means our dogs, they're coming from Foster's family. They have backgrounds. They have, you know, family issue because uh, most of them, there's some, you know, uh, we know the father and mother, sometimes it's the third or the fourth letter. So we know those guys. But at the end of the day, uh, we, we live with those dogs for six, seven months and they grow up, they mature in the, mature the, in the, in the kennel, in the training, they change. So, and the same in, in the other way, you guys, when you apply to having a dog, uh, when you apply, let's say, in uh, spring, and finally the class is one year and a half or one year after, uh, you guys change. Sometimes your life change, sometimes the vision change, sometimes something in your life that 
change your your reality so when you guys come in the kennel even if i have everything on paper where you live and everything we have kind of id okay of um you know which dog with with who because of the speed of walking because of the environment and everything but at the end of the day we always um, and it's very easy and i would say that's something that always discussed between instructors because it's so easy to say oh i have the dog perfect dog for molly okay one dog so but do you have another one or a second choice a c plan do you have a c or b plan oh yeah 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 but th that one is good and finally we're arriving in the class and we don't share with you guys sometimes we are, are the first pick and finally it's not the first pick it's the third pick that really the matchup creates so if you're like closing your spirit your mind and say no it's that dog's gonna be with molly i can i think that you can hit a wall yeah so that's why I think putting ourselves in the box that say that dog with that person, I would say that it cuts us uh, all the magic that we got, we we can't we can sorry uh, create in the kennel with you guys. When I got matched with Gypsy, I'll never forget um, another person in the class was working her in the kennels, and she just kept guiding her to me and sitting down. Okay. And Natalie was like, "All right, we need to try you with Gypsy because." she just is attracted to you yeah and all of a sudden she was doing things that she never would do yeah and they were like she's picked you like she wants to work for you yeah and so she's going to work for you yeah. you know because she feels something and she might not do that for somebody else but because she seemed to have this pull to you she's going to to do it yeah and it, it really is like giving everybody a chance to have a say even the dog yeah. getting a chance to say this is what i want to do yeah, yeah. That, that's some behavior that the dogs some dogs do or sometimes it's it, it, it looked like nothing and the, the the boundings slowly deeply built and sometimes creates amazing teams so yeah. it it took a lot of root different route to create a relationship like between human beings and i think it's the same uh, but you know that's that's the way we work I think that it creates opportunity that maybe create strong teams slowly we we work in that spirit and I think that it's it, it pays and I, I think that uh, we 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 have to continue to learn from our experience and uh, it's gonna be a life life uh, working yeah, I think, I mean, you have a very balanced approach to the training of the dogs, and I really appreciate that. I feel like I've learned so much over the years from all the trainers I've worked with, mm -hmm. and these dogs have truly been life-changing for me, and I'll be back in my 30s, yeah. I'll be back in my 40s, you'll yes, see me for yes, the rest sir. of my life. Yes, sir. I will be getting my pups, and um, I couldn't appreciate you guys more for everything you've done to change my life. Yeah, um, you're welcome. You're so welcome. And thank you to all of you for donating, for supporting um, such an important cause that is life changing for not only me, for everybody else in my class, yeah. for everybody else who has ever received a mirror dog. I I think I'm out of questions. Is there anything else you want to add? No, I'm super happy. Yeah. I'm just happy. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. I think it is a dog. <laughs> oh wow. Nice. He is nice. actually. He is. He's made by an artist. Yeah. Yes. Wow. This is super nice. He's a little piece of art. And he's very tactile. Yes. And I thought he looked like a Mira dog. Yeah. I thought <laughs> he looks he... like this dude. Yeah. <laughs> very nice. I thought he could. He could. We could maybe figure out a way to put a little harness on him. Yeah, I think so too. Right? Very oh, nice. So cute in a harness. <laughs> Thank you. Of course. Thank you. For sure we're going to use it. For sure. I, I think you'll find some. We can put some you. lights. Huh? Oh, lights on oh, there. Oh, yeah. 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 During Christmas yeah. and stuff like this. Yeah. Huh? We, can, you know, you know, we, can put, uh, we can put this dude uh, somewhere. And I think always we're testing the behavior of our dogs. Okay? Yeah. <laughs>